Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and today I'm going to talk about why Solid is stupid. <laughs> okay, so before I start ripping into Solid programming principles and explaining why I think it is stupid, I'm going to preface this whole conversation saying Solid does have some useful things. There are some useful principles in there that just get used in the wrong way and that are applied without judgment. Okay, so before we can start talking about why solid is bad, what is solid? Okay, uh, you've probably heard of solid programming principles. They were developed 20 years ago in the year 2000 by Uncle Bob or Robert Martin. Think about that for a second. This programming principles that many programmers still hail today as the end all be all of all programming principles out there was developed 20 years ago. Now there's two things, two possibilities for why programmers still hail it today. One, it's because it's really a good principle and so we should use it. And that's why it's withstood the test of time. The second is because people don't like to change. And so even though this may not be the best solution out there, they refuse to change and accept better solutions. And I'm proposing it's more the latter than the former. So what is solid, right? We can't really talk about why it's bad without knowing what it is. Well, solid is an acronym and it stands for the S, single responsibility principle, which basically states that one class should be used for one responsibility, okay? And so what this often leads to is individual classes and individual files that have individual purposes. That's the single responsibility principle. What is O? O is the open close principle, which states that Classes should be open for extensibility, but closed for modification. So basically, if you have functions in a class, you are allowed to add more functions, but you shouldn't really change the functionality. So you shouldn't really change the functions that are already in there. You shouldn't change the names. You shouldn't change what they do, what they output. They should remain the same. The Liskov substitution principle. This states that any subclass should be able to replace its parent class. All right. So what this means is if you have a class component which has a subclass texture, right? So texture is a type of component. Well, you should be able to use texture as a component directly. You should be able to use component as a component directly. This has some other design flaws. People don't really follow this principle at all. And even the, the people who say that you should use solid, they say, well, Liskov substitution principle isn't really the best principle to follow anymore. The interface segregation principle. What this says is many interfaces are better than one big interface. So instead of having one giant interface that you have a bunch of different classes implementing, you should have many interfaces that different classes implement each interface directly. And then lastly, this is the one that I loathe. This is the worst principle of solid, the dependency inversion principle. That's the D. This basically states that your dependencies should be not controlled by the class who uses the dependency, but should be be controlled by some outside class. So what ends up happening is developers often use these things called IOC containers, inversion to control containers to handle this management. And then you get a bunch of more abstraction and abstraction and abstraction and abstraction. Oh, it's great. Okay. Anyways, so why did Uncle Bob develop this? Well, you can look at the paper that I have linked in the description. He developed this because he had dependency management problems. So he said, these five patterns will solve dependency management, but what we'll find out, the nasty little secret that no one wants to tell you is that dependency management is not solved. It is simply handled elsewhere, okay? Dependency management is still an issue. It has never been solved. You are just offloading the responsibility to somebody else. Now, let's take a look at the bad code that these principles lead to and why we should want to avoid it, okay? Why if you're actually developing for the real world and you want to de deliver a product, these patterns will hamper, not help, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is how individual class names are usually used in individual files because of the single responsibility principle. So what you'll end up with is, say you have some render system, right? This render system needs a sprite render. Well. The sprite render we're going to place in its own class and it's just some data, right? And then we have the sprite, which is also just some data. And so these all get their own file. They're down in a different file path and everything. And then the render system uses all this. Well, we have a bug, which happens quite often in programming. And now all of a sudden sprite render is calling some function. 
well, I don't know what this function does, and it looks like the bug might actually be emanating. So then I have to go into Sprite Render. Well, Sprite Render actually has this Sprite class. Well, now I have to go into Sprite. Well, this has this texture class. Now I have to go into this texture class. On and on it goes until you finally find the bug that you're looking for. Now, usually you can handle this with a stack trace, and you can see where the bug is emanating directly from. But often you will have side effects. What would be better is since these are all the same functionality, these all share the same purpose, we should move these classes directly into the class with the render system. Why? Because the render system is likely the only person who manages these and deals with these directly. You may use these as data, but this data is mainly used within this class. So keep it all together. This means that your context will not be switched because as you know, when you are programming and your mind has to split between so many different things, it makes it harder to follow a program. When you separate classes into every single individual file, you are splitting context, splitting context, splitting context, and it does not help. The next thing I'm going to talk about is fitting square shaped problems and solving them using circle shaped solutions. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is usually you have some sort of problem domain and because we have to use object oriented programming, which solid is a huge proponent of, right? Solid doesn't exist without object oriented. They go hand in hand. Well, because everything must be an object, you have to wrap your mind in these really weird places when some problem doesn't really fit a real world object. And so what you end up with is these classes, which we will call the er classes, the scene manager, the scene helper, the scene, you know, these classes, these doer classes. What do they do? Well, they're not an object. So why are we representing it as an object? Well, the reason we're representing it as an object is because, you know, some programmers told us, well, having functionality within the class isn't actually good, even though that is really the point of object oriented programming is to combine data and logic. So they say we should have these manager, these systems, all these classes that handle the data. Well, the problem with this is now we have a needless dependency. What do I mean by that? Now somebody has to create the scene manager class and decide when to kill the scene manager class because it's now needs to be done. Instead, what languages like C++ do is they have something called namespaces, right? We can just say namespace scene manager, and then we can just have our function switch scene, which takes in a scene, and then that does some other stuff. And then when you're calling it, all you have to say is scene manager, switch scene, and then pass in some scene. This is so much better because what this is saying is, hey, I have this functionality. This functionality is not tied with any specific thing. Uh, and actually, I would even go even further and say, maybe not call this scene manager, maybe call it scene. And then this is a namespace, which is separate from a class, but the naming doesn't really matter. All that matters is we're saying we have some functionality that is not necessarily tied to an object. And we don't want to tie this to an object because it's just functionality that we need. So by wrapping it in this namespace, we just have the functionality and we don't have to worry about managing objects. Uh, needless dependency gone, <laughs> okay? So it's really as simple as this in a language like C++. In Java, you can simulate this by doing a public static class and then making these all static functions, which has other problems too, because then this is like a global, this is like a global too, but you know, global functions aren't all that bad as many people would like you to believe. They can lead to problems, don't get me wrong. There's a reason people say to avoid it, but I think there's exceptions in all these cases. Another thing I typically see when you're following the solid pattern is duplicated code, the exact thing that it's trying to avoid. Why do we get du duplicated code when we have these problems? Well, the reason we get this duplicated code is because you're trying to fit every single thing into a specific real world problem domain. Well, the fact of the matter is we're dealing with bits and bytes. We're not dealing with actual objects here. And so you end up getting a lot of code that does the same exact thing just with another object. Now you could solve this with generics and everything, but then there's more problems because, well, should I really abstract it to this level? I don't know yet. And so trying to solve a problem with a predefined solution in your head saying, I'm going to use solid often leads to these problems. And then you get duplicated code and you look through the code base. You're like, hey, this is all doing the same thing, just with different objects and stuff. And you end up with a mess and trying to add code becomes more difficult rather than easier. So the next thing that I want to talk about is forcing everything into a design pattern. Now, Solid doesn't necessarily say this, but the people who propose that Solid is a good coding technique are typically the same people who are saying everything follows this pattern because this pattern is good. 
That's never a reason you should follow a pattern. If you say, I follow this pattern because this pattern is good, you're doing something wrong, okay? Now, let's take a look at what I mean when I say this. Usually, uh, I've seen this where you have some REST response, right? Some REST API. And so this one pattern, command query, execute pattern or whatever, it's something like that. Uh, you basically have a REST query object, you have a REST response object, and you have a REST handler object. This is just some data. This is just some data. Remember, these are all in separate files because uh, we cannot have these in the same file. That's just horrible coding practice. Look at how ugly this is. And then you have this handler, which basically just takes in the query, returns a response, and does very minimal code. Instead, what you could do is say you have your controller, right? So just some controller. Instead of wiring everything through this useless pattern that adds completely useless complexity, why don't you just say, hey, when I ask for uh, some REST response, do get some stuff, we can just say return whatever API you're using and then just like some API dot get some stuff, which returns a response. And then you can get rid of all this. Okay, there's absolutely no reason to use these stupid patterns. And it may not necessarily be this command query pattern that you see people using, but it may be some other pattern. Uh, dependency injection is one we'll talk about pretty soon, where they use it because they use it because they use it. They, never good reason to use a pattern. And patterns themselves are quite misleading. And now, why are patterns themselves misleading? Okay, well, I keep talking about these design patterns and stuff, and I do want to talk about that in a little bit better and a little bit more of a clear manner before moving on. If we look up the definition of a pattern, what Google tells us is a pattern gives a regular or intelligible form to. Okay, it gives an intelligible form to something. What does that mean? That means that a pattern is supposed to be used to describe. A pattern is not to be used. Okay, the whole reason the Gang of Four wrote their book, Design Patterns, was to effectively communicate with other developers. They said, hey, I see that we all use these similar techniques. Let's give it a name that we can all agree on. Then when I'm talking to you, you can say, hey, I'm using the strategy pattern. And then somebody else can be like, oh, cool. I use the strategy pattern too. And I know what that means. And now I know what your code is doing. That's what the design patterns are for. The design patterns were never intended to be, hey, I think you should use the strategy pattern because I've heard that it's good and it solves problems. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. This whole reason for the patterns, the whole reason the Gang of Four wrote that book is that you can identify pieces of code that do similar things and say, oh, this is a pattern. Now I can talk to other developers and explain what my code is doing very clearly, very concisely without wasting time. Now, another thing we've been talking a lot about is a principle, right? So solid are all principles. What is a principle? Well, if we Google the definition of this too, a principle is a proposition or value that is a guide for behavior or evaluation. In law, it is a rule that has to be, or usually is to be followed, or can be desirably followed. What is Google saying? Google is saying a principle is something that is true, that is profoundly true. Code and programming is less than 100 years old. We do not have the privilege of the other sciences like math and physics that are literally thousands of years old to be able to say this has been used for thousands of years. It has been proven to be true. Programming does not have any true principles. If anyone tells you something is a principle in programming, they are lying to you. Okay, we are in a constantly evolving environment and these principles are definitely bound to change. That's one of the reasons why this is 20 years old. And I think we've definitely seen through the test of time that this is not good principles to follow. <laughs> okay, anyways, let's continue. So remember the I in the whole interface, whatever solid principles? Well, that I basically means use interfaces for everything. Don't, don't do this, okay? Using interfaces for everything is another sign that you're doing something wrong. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say you have a random number generator that you have to make. So you create this I random service, which has this get random number, get random number between, get random float. And then you have this random service, which implements the I random service and actually does all these functions. Nice, right? You may be thinking, well, remember, first of all, this isn't a different file because we can't have them in the same file. That's horrible, ugly, disgusting. <laughs> okay. Second of all, why is this useful? Well, the solid proponents, the people who propose solid are going to say it's useful because what if one day, what if, you know, that great what if, who knows, maybe one day you want a random number service from online and this implements iRandom service. 
Why do you want it from online? Because who knows, maybe there's a better random number generator online that you're going to interface and then you can just swap it out. You don't have to do anything fancy. You just get rid of this one. Now you use this one, right? Except you don't have to get rid of this one. You can leave this one in your code, but this is stupid. Okay. Why is this stupid? Because immediately, as soon as you say you're using this service instead of this service, this service is deprecated. This is no longer good. You're basically saying this code is no longer good. So instead of doing this, why not remove this? Remove this. No more interfaces. Okay. You just have the concrete implementation. You decide one day, hey, I should be using this from online. You know what you do? You change the code in here. You change the code in here. You change the code in here. No reason to completely create a new class. You don't have to worry about changing code anymore because we have source control. Okay. If this ends up being a disaster, revert. You can just go back a few commits. You can look in your source control and go back to the branch that all the things went to mayhem and fix it. All right. Now, the only other place where I see this being possibly good is say you have some I file, right? So this is an uh, interface. And the reason it's an interface is because you have Windows, you have Mac, you have Linux, you have Android, you have iOS, whatever, lots of different file systems, right? And so you create this one I file class and then you have a bunch of different implementations. So like you have class Win32 file, you have class Win64 file, so on and so forth. This is useless. Okay, if you're programming a language like C++, you can just say, hey, if we are in Win32, then just create a class called file and that class will look like this. And then you can say else if we're in Mac OS, create a class called file <laughs> and make it look like this. Okay, not only does this speed up your code, but it also says we don't actually need that fancy interface and whatever and switcheroo at runtime. We can do this all at compile time because when you're compiling on a specific platform, you know exactly what platform you're on. <laughs> okay, so then you can just use the class implementation for that platform. No need for interfaces still. Okay. Okay. And the last thing I want to talk about that solid leads to is the dependency injection, right? The D dependency inversion. No, <laughs> just no. Dependency inversion does not get rid of dependencies. I think I already said this, but I cannot iterate this enough. Dependency inversion does not get rid of dependencies. Let's take a look at this. So say you have this wonderful class. Ah, oh, this is following great patterns, as you can see, because everything is an interface. That's beautiful. And it's also getting passed into the constructor. I'm not constructing any of these. So it's great. It's perfect. It's flawless code design. But really, is it? Okay. The whole purpose that Bob Martin said we should do this is to get rid of or to manage dependencies. Well, I have a nasty little secret for you. I think I already said this too. The dependency is still there. It is still here. Look at this. This class still depends on message handler. Instead, what I would suggest you do is you create these by hand. You see how many classes need them. And then when you see that a lot of different classes are needing this iLogger, for instance, then you say, hey, maybe this is better as not a dependency, but maybe it's better as a namespace. And then this namespace can do certain things because we're just using this functionally. We're not even using this as an object anymore. And then if this class is the only class that needs the I number generator, how about we just add that right in here? And don't even do the interface because we already looked at why that's stupid. And what you end up finding out when you refactor your code instead of starting from this is you find out that you include a lot of dependencies that are actually useless. I actually don't really need this iMessage handler. I actually don't really need this iConfiguration settings. And so on and so forth until you're left with minimal dependencies, which is how it should be. And the dependencies that you do have are usually only for one or two classes, which is as it should be. Do not use an IOC container. An IOC container means that you don't know what you are architecting and you are just randomly pulling at straws to make your code look clean when it's not really. Okay, so we've looked at a lot of the different problems that arise from solid programming principles. And the number one problem I can say that arises from this is uh, solid programmers have pretty code. Okay. They have pretty code. They don't have very useful code. <laughs> okay. And what I mean by useful code is if I'm debugging, 
and I have to wade through all this complexity that you added for absolutely no reason. This makes me a very happy, unhappy programmer, okay? It's useless complexity. It's complexity for the sake of complexity. That is never a good reason to do things. Instead, what I propose, code for a solution. Solve the problem at hand. Then when you start to see patterns and you start to see code duplication, abstract. That's when you abstract. You don't abstract at the beginning because you never know what you're going to need until you start delving into this problem. Jonathan Blow, I was watching him the other day and he put it beautifully. He said, the whole point of engineering is, especially software engineering, you have a bunch of many subdomains, okay? Very small subdomains that have very specific problem sets. And you can't just go blindly applying different practices to these subdomains because they have very specific solutions. So you come up with the specific solution, you learn about that problem, you learn about that domain. Once you start learning about it, you can more intelligently abstract and come up with patterns for that specific problem. Okay, so don't blindly follow practices. Blindly following best practices is not a best practice. Don't do it, okay? And I think we have to ask ourselves, why are programmers doing this? Why do programmers put themselves in these situations? And the reason is, I think programmers are solving imaginary problems. Check the description. There is a link to a great article about this. But basically, in your day-to-day -day job, you are solving very mundane REST API type problems where it's like, oh, I got to go get some data. I got to return the data to the website, display the data. That's basically all you're doing. And so these programmers get bored and to maintain sanity, they say, I must create a complex system. This has to be the perfect system, the most scalable system, extensible, because who knows, we might become Facebook serving billions of users, even though we really only have 100 users at our company who are ever going to actually use this product. And so instead of coming up with the most reasonable solution, they come up with this wacky, uh, over-architected design because that's the way to do things so that I don't lose my sanity and so that I feel like I'm doing something important, okay? This is the reason programmers do this. Now, I would love to hear your guys' opinions. Leave a comment. I'm not completely trashing solid. I do think that there is a lot of misguided application and it should be used judiciously, which means you should use it with judgment. Use these practices with judgment. Use the mind that God's given you. Don't just blindly do stuff. That's all I got to say today, guys. Thanks for watching. See ya.